Welcome to the Insomnia Coach Podcast. My name is Martin Reed. I believe that nobody needs to live with chronic insomnia and that cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI techniques, can help you enjoy better sleep for the rest of your life. I talk a lot about cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI, in this podcast. This episode will explain exactly what CBTI is and how it helps improve sleep. The audio from this episode was taken from a Facebook Live originally recorded in May 2019. You can find the Insomnia Coach Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash insomnia coach. You can also watch the video that accompanies this podcast on the Insomnia Coach YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com forward slash insomnia coach and click on the insomnia coach podcast playlist. I just want to talk a little bit about CBTI, um, what it is, um, why it's the best treatment, the best, certainly the best long-term treatment for chronic insomnia. Um, Just because I think that we're still really struggling with getting the awareness of CBTI out there and what it is, what it means. Um, And I just want to say this right from the start, that CBT is not CBD. It's not a marijuana product, a cannabis product. CBTI is a collection of skills. Um, So anyway, with that out of the way, let's get going. Um, So CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. Now, it's not therapy in the traditional sense of the word. Like you're not, it probably gives you these ideas that you're lying on a couch um, with your your hand on your head, eyes closed, just recounting all your fears and worries. It's not really therapy in that traditional kind of stereotypical idea that we have around around therapy. Um, What CBTI is, is a collection of techniques or skills that you can implement that effectively retrain you um, to to trust your sleep system again Um, and over time this reduces any sleep related worries Um, it also helps you identify and address and fix any behaviors that you're some that you might be implementing in an attempt to kind of compensate for bad sleep or lost sleep that can actually perpetuate insomnia and make the problem worse um, it's CBTI also helps correct like any unrealistic thoughts or incorrect thoughts that you might have about your sleep or unrealistic expectations that you have around sleep that usually just end up putting extra pressure on you. Um, you, you feel like, oh, I've really got to get like these eight hours of sleep, for example. Um, and that, that in itself makes sleep more difficult. So with that being said there are some core components of cbti Um, all practitioners generally follow a similar pattern in terms of how they implement or the um, the actual components that they're using Um, but they might just have slightly different philosophies as to the best way to encourage people to observe the the techniques and the components um, but generally speaking, it, it won't vary that much from provider to provider because they're all evidence-based techniques. Um, so with that being said, um, what I would like to do is just talk about how, how I approach CBTI. Um, now, with my company, insomniacoach.com, I offer a phone coaching package and also offer an online course. Um, so I'm going to talk about the online course primarily because it's more structured. So it helps me uh, use that as an example for how we introduce each stage of CBTI and what's involved. So when I work with new clients, I generally like to start with sleep education. Um, and that's just because all of us, I'm not talking specifically about people with insomnia here, but virtually everyone has unrealistic expectations or beliefs about sleep. Um, and most of us don't really understand what sleep is or what normal sleep is. So I like to start off with sleep education just to kind of challenge any incorrect thoughts or assumptions about sleep 
because these can really pile on the pressure if 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 you believe that you should be sleeping in a certain way or if you believe that some part of your sleep isn't normal when in fact it probably quite is normal um, all these things build that sleep anxiety and make sleep more difficult so that's why i always start off with a little bit of sleep education um, then i like to introduce the sleep diary so it's really difficult to get a good overview of your current sleep patterns without a sleep diary um, because if i say to you now how much sleep do you think you get on a typical night it's quite difficult to answer that question because you'll be thinking of the night that you had a really bad sleep and then the night that you maybe had a little bit better sleep so it's hard for you to off the top of your head give me an answer to that or give yourself an answer to that so by keeping a sleep diary for at least a week um, you can get a better overall picture of your sleep because you can kind of like get an average of your sleep over the course of a week and you can see then gives you a bit more of a clearer picture as to how long on average it's taking you to fall asleep how many times on average you're waking during the night uh, how much sleep you're getting on a typical night so the sleep diary is good for that because it gives you a good overview of where you currently are in, with regards to your sleep but it's also really helpful because it helps us monitor progress so as the weeks go by as you're working through a course of cbti you can actually see the the techniques are working so you might have had a bad night um, like halfway through a cbti course for example if you weren't keeping a sleep diary you're probably likely to dwell on that bad night but if you were keeping a sleep diary as you should be when you're going through a course of cbti you'd be able to look at your sleep diary and see the general overall trend is still positive and that can be really helpful all right so that's like the introduction to getting started with cbti now Practitioners will introduce the remaining components at different times, or they might slightly customize them according to your individual needs. Um, but then you're generally looking at sleep restriction, which is a terrible phrase because it implies that we're restricting sleep. We are not restricting sleep. What we're doing is restricting time in bed. Okay, so a lot of people with chronic insomnia say they might average let's say four hours of sleep at night but they're getting in bed at 10 o'clock at night and getting out of bed at six in the morning so they're allotting eight hours for sleep but they're only getting four hours so that means that the other four hours are just spent awake in bed tossing and turning feeling anxious worried frustrated and this doesn't help us sleep so sleep restriction is about reducing this sleep window down to more closely match the amount of time you spend asleep. Now the goal here is to consolidate sleep. So instead of spreading out tiny little snippets of sleep throughout a really long sleep period, you're gonna be getting nice, strong, uninterrupted chunks of deeper, more restorative sleep. The other benefit of this is it helps strengthen and create and strengthen an association between the bed and sleep. So a lot of people with chronic insomnia, especially if you've been suffering from insomnia for a really long time, you've kind of learned to associate the bed with being awake, being frustrated, being anxious, because you spend a lot of time in bed doing those things. So with sleep restriction or bedtime restriction, you're going to be spending almost all of the, your time in bed asleep instead of awake. So over time, this retrains you to see the bed as a place for sleep. And over time, this makes the bed a strong trigger for sleep. So that's sleep restriction or bedtime restriction. Uh, the next technique that's often used is called stimulus control. Another really terrible phrase, terminology is very scientific, research-based. Stimulus control basically means, as I touched on before, we want to associate the bed with sleep and nothing else. Okay, so 
insomnia really is when it when insomnia gets perpetuated when it gets just keeps on going it's insomnia 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 and it gets worse and worse over time it's perpetuated this is kind of like a this is a symptom of like a learned association between the bed and bad things like you go to bed and you're expecting a bad night you're expecting to be awake and we want to break this learned association and get you back to the good old days where you thought about your bed or you got into bed and you felt great. The only way to do this is to make sure that the only thing you do in bed is sleep. So for, to get started, what we do is make sure that you see the bed as a place only for sleep. So you're not watching TV in bed, you're not um, writing an essay in bed if you're doing homework for example you're not checking emails in bed um, you're not doing any activity in bed apart from sleep um, we do have a little side note that it's okay for sexual activity to take place in bed because that generally doesn't have a negative effect on sleep um, but generally speaking the only thing you do in bed is sleep and that's really what stimulus control is about now the hardest thing about stimulus control is that it also means that if you're in bed at night and you can't fall asleep or if you wake up and you can't fall back to sleep then you get out of bed and you wait until you feel sleepy again then you get back into bed and you repeat the process so if you can't fall back to sleep then again you get out of bed so this is a really hard technique to follow because it can kind of make you into this human yo-yo where you're in and out of bed all night long. So the reason this is difficult, I'm sure you're thinking it right now. How am I going to get to sleep if I'm in and out of bed all night? Well, when you're implementing stimulus control, it may well lead to less sleep in the short term. But you have to remember that what we're trying to do here is give you a long-term solution to your insomnia. And to get all these long-term benefits, unfortunately, there is a bit of short-term pain. There is a little bit of difficulty getting started in order to reap those long-term benefits. So if you're awake in bed after waking up during the night or you're struggling to fall asleep, you can wait like 20, 30 minutes just estimate this amount of time in your head. You don't want to be clock watching. Or if you just feel really wide awake and anxious and you just know that you're not going to fall asleep, then that's your cue to get out of bed, go into like the living room or another room and just engage yourself in like a relaxing, enjoyable activity. Something that's a little bit more enjoyable than lying in bed, tossing and turning, being mad that you can't sleep. Um, some good examples would be like reading, uh, listening to an audio book. Um, some people like to do crosswords or like Sudoku puzzles or things like that. Um, and then once you start to feel yourself get sleepy again, then that's your cue to go back to bed. Not try to sleep, but just lie back down in bed and just see what happens. And if you're struggling again, it's been like another 20, 30 minutes, or you're feeling really anxious again, and you repeat the process. You get out of bed until you feel sleepy again. Now, it's important to bear in mind that this technique is certainly not intended to improve your sleep on the night that you're trying it out. It, this is like an investment in your long-term success. So the first few nights, maybe even the first couple of weeks, could well lead to less sleep because you're going to be getting in and out of bed. But what this does is it kind of like builds up any loss of sleep builds up sleep drive. So as long as you stay committed, this propensity, your desire to sleep will get stronger and stronger and stronger until you're gonna get to the point where when you're combining it with like this bedtime restriction, as your bedtime approaches, as the start of your sleep window approaches, you're gonna be starting to get really sleepy the longer you commit to these techniques. And so this increases the chance of sleep and it also will help consolidate your sleep. So it's gonna be less fragmented, it's gonna be a deeper sleep. And when you wake during the night, you're gonna to start to recognize that the bed is a place for sleep. So you'll be less concerned when you wake during the night. 
And this will mean that over time, you'll actually need to get out of bed less often. So these are probably the two main techniques of CVTI, like the uh, sleep restriction, the bedtime restriction, following a sleep window that's appropriate to your average nightly sleep duration, and stimulus control, which is about getting out of bed when you can't sleep, using the bed only for sleep, so that you can build this association between the bed and sleep. Um, so then CBTI will normally include some kind of relaxation component. Um, in my online course, I put this like just around about the halfway mark because I, th I, see the, I see sleep restriction and stimulus control as the best techniques. They're the best two, the most effective um, in a course of CBTI. But relaxation definitely has its place. But it's important to note that relaxation is not intended to make you sleep. The goal of relaxation is relaxation. That's it. And relaxation is a skill. So it takes a lot of time and a lot of practice before you actually get good at it. So when I introduce relaxation, when I'm working with clients, I encourage just practicing relaxation during the day for two weeks before you even try it in the evening. So this could be like a guided meditation or progressive muscle relaxation. Um, th th there's a number of different relaxation techniques out there. Um, but it's important to just see the goal of relaxation is relaxation to practice for a couple of weeks during the day. And then what you can do is once you feel like you're starting to get proficient, you're starting to get quite good at the relaxation techniques, they're helping you relax, you can start introducing them like in the evening, like closer to your bedtime. Um, I like to call the hour before bed as like the buffer zone where you just reserve that time for relaxing, enjoyable activities to help you unwind. And this can be a good time to implement some of these relaxation techniques just to help you unwind and relax um, and kind of like put the day to bed before you get into bed. Um, some people also find that relaxation can be helpful um, for like when they first get into bed or when, if you wake during the night and you start to feel a tiny little bit of anxiety creeping up, sometimes just doing um, like a, some visual imagery or some progressive muscle relaxation um, can help relax you and calm you back down and a result might be you fall back to sleep but just remember that your goal is relaxation not sleep um, so what else uh, CBTI it, it often includes some component of sleep hygiene um, the problem that with sleep hygiene is there's no evidence that it is an effective treatment for chronic insomnia um, so by itself sleep hygiene won't really do anything uh, when they do research studies looking at good treatment options for chronic insomnia, they often give sleep hygiene to the control group, like the no treatment group, because uh, in the medical community, in the scientific community, the academic community, we know that sleep hygiene doesn't work. So we use, we offer sleep hygiene to the control group as like the no treatment group. But with that being said, when used in combination with CBTI, there may be some benefits, especially if uh, your sleep can sometimes be disrupted by environmental cues, um, such as uh, like if there's a lot of light or sound coming into your bedroom, things like that. Um, so I, I go through sleep hygiene right towards the end um, of a course of CBTI when I'm working with clients. And then the very last thing that is usually covered is relapse prevention. So by the time you get to the end of a course of CBTI, you've got all these skills, you should be seeing some notable improvements in your sleep, but it's important to bear in mind that you're still gonna have bad nights every now and then, right? Because everyone has a bad night every now and then. The best sleepers in the world have a bad night of sleep every now and then. You know, like you get some bad news or you have to move house, change job, or there's a health scare, something like this. That's gonna, be upsetting and it's going to add stress and it's going to disrupt sleep. So relapse prevention is all about recognizing and expecting bad nights to occur in the future, but also reminding you of all the techniques that you found helpful during your course of CBTI. 
that you can fall back on should you need them in the future. Now this is why CBTI is so great and it's such a fantastic treatment for such a fantastic long-term solution for insomnia is because it's a collection of skills and techniques. And once you've learned them, they are with you for life. It's not like an ongoing subscription. Like you're not having to pay money every month for the rest of your life like you would with supplements or sleeping pills or something like that because you've learned these skills and they will be with you forever. And so any time that your sleep gets disrupted again in the future, you just empty that vault back in your mind and remember all the skills that you learned and you can reintroduce these into your routine and get your sleep back on track. All right, so we're about the 20 minute mark now. I think I'm gonna call it a day. If you've never given CBTI a try, I really encourage you to look into it. Um, ask your doctor about it, um, just Google it, um, just, just become more aware of it. Um, it it's, really challenging um, when I'm in like these insomnia support forums or I'm just talking to people with insomnia and they could have been suffering with insomnia for like 10, 20, 30 years and they, they tell me they've tried everything but they've never heard of CBTI. Um, and Through no fault of their own, we're just doing a really bad job of getting this awareness out there. So my real aim is just to give you that awareness and I really hope you'll take the next step and just do a little bit of research about it. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to help out. You can email me. My email address is hello at insomniacoach.com. Thanks for listening to the Insomnia Coach podcast. If you're ready to implement cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia CBTI techniques to improve your sleep, but think you might need some additional support and guidance, I would love to help. There are two ways we can work together. First, you can get my online coaching course. This is the most popular option. My course combines sleep education with unlimited support and guidance and is guaranteed to improve your sleep. I will teach you and help you implement new CBTI techniques over a period of eight weeks. This gives you time to build sleep confidence and notice results without feeling overwhelmed. You can get the course and start right now at insomniacoach.com forward slash online. I also offer a phone coaching package where we start with a one hour call. This can be voice only or video, your choice, and we come up with an initial two week plan that will have you implementing CBTI techniques that will lead to long-term improvements in your sleep. You get unlimited email-based support and guidance for two weeks after the call, along with a half-hour follow-up call at the end of the two weeks. You can book the phone coaching package at insomniacoach.com forward slash phone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Insomnia Coach podcast. I'm Martin Reed, and as always, I'd like to leave you with this important reminder. You can sleep.